Thank you for being with us today. I'm Butch Howard, and we're at Appalachian Baptist Church in Greer, South Carolina. It is the first Sunday in 2024. I hope you've had a good New Year's week so far, and uh, we're excited about the new open doors, new opportunities that are ahead of all of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, uh, you can approach anything that is new, uh, either with optimism or pessimism. And, uh, of course, I tend to fall in the category more, I will say, I'm a realist. But when we know what the Bible teaches us, I think this is very important for every believer. If we know what the Bible teaches us and we believe it, and we'll talk about faith in a few minutes, but if we really believe it, then God's people should be the most optimistic people in the world. There are are things that are happening in our day. I was talking to our student pastor today, and uh, we were talking about the developments going on in the world. We are blessed to be living in the era when so many prophetic revelations are coming to pass, literally right now. And when we look at these things from the scriptural perspective, we know without any doubt that our God is in control. When the Lord is in control, dear believer, we can rest in him. So uh, today, after we, last week, we went through some things that we can watch for trends uh, and responses in uh, 24. I hope that you were helped by that, uh, that time in Luke chapter 21. Today, we want to begin a five-part series on life-changing faith. Real faith is life-changing. In fact, I would argue the point that if it doesn't change you, it may not be real faith at all. So I want you to find your way to Luke in the fifth chapter today. We want to look at a life-changing experience that to start with seemed very ordinary. But that day changed the lives and the destiny of Three men, Peter, James, and John. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and I know you have concerns. We all do. We ask for many of our people today, if you're part of our homebound, who are watching uh, the study on uh, YouTube, we, uh, we have many here that are sick, so pray for these church family members who have various things. We've got a lot of sickness going on, so pray for these, and I know you have your needs as well. We know the one who is the great physician. We also know him to be good and faithful to us in every way. Father, we love you today. It's our joy to open again your precious word together. We ask that as we're able to uh, sit in the homes of our viewers today that you will speak through your word through this clay vessel, this servant, and say those things that we need the most today. We ask your blessings upon those who are in need and sickness and various concerns that you know all about. We pray that today will be a, a life-changing day for someone. Uh, even the, the child of God sometimes needs to allow you to stir up their faith uh, and make it vibrant and uh, powerful and life-changing in their lives. We thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. In Luke chapter 5, uh, the story goes something like this. Jesus was walking the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, the fishermen were just concluding their day. Uh, in this particular case, Peter, James, and John had been on the water all night long, so this was early, and they had come to shore. They had uh, taken their nets from their ship and were on the, the shoreline uh, cleaning and mending their, their nets so that they would be ready for the next, uh, the next time out. These were vocational fishermen. They were not sportsmen. They were not fishing for the fun of it or the sport of it. This was their livelihood. They were professional fishermen. 
And so they see this man walking on the shoreline, and he's teaching people. He has a gathering that is there. And uh, as they begin to work their nets, they are in earshot of what this teacher is saying to those who have gathered around him. And we join it here in verse 2. He says, And uh, the Lord saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And Jesus entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. And he prayed or he requested that he would thrust out that ship uh, a little from the land just into the shallow water it would not have been deep enough for the ship to have come loose from the moorings of the sandy underneath it would it would have been stationary but it was out a little ways and so Jesus is now going to teach these people what prompted all of this was, as we said, they were mending their nets and they had heard Jesus. So something in what they were seeing and hearing uh, prompted Simon Peter to be willing to honor this request from the teacher, and he did so. Now, when he had finished speaking, we come to verse 4, the Bible lesson is over. Uh, Jesus has ceased teaching, and the crowd that had gathered there to hear him was dispersing. So he said in verse 4, when he had ended speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draw. Now, if you're a professional fisherman and you've never seen or heard this man, Jesus, and all of a sudden he says, I want you to go out in the, into the water, and I want you to drop your nets. You're thinking this, who are you, and how dare you say such a thing to me? I'm a professional fisherman. This is what I do for a living. In fact, Simon says, Master, we've told all night, and we've taken nothing. Something in what Jesus had been teaching and what he had been saying and how the people were responding to him, provoked Peter to agree to this, what seemed like a preponderous suggestion. It would be the equivalent of us uh, telling deep sea fishermen uh, that they need to go out and follow our instructions in order to fit. We know nothing about it. Jesus was a stranger. They knew nothing about him and assumed he knew nothing about fishing. Let's keep reading. So when he had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish in verse 6. Their net began to break. And so they asked their fellow fishermen in other boats to join them. Verse 7, they beckoned unto their partners, which were in another ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled, watch this, both ships with fish to the point both of these ships began to sink. This was an overload of fish. Not on one ship alone, but two. Now, where we're going with this is life-changing faith. In fact, what is about to happen here is so radical that it completely altered the lives, the daily lives as well as the destinies of Peter, James, and John. I want you to notice several things that he comes to these fishermen in the midst of a normal day. These were normal circumstances. Hundreds, if not thousands of times, these fishermen had come in from the water cleaned and mended their nets and prepared for the next excursion. What was different was this teacher. They heard, they saw, and then they were compelled to either follow his instructions or decline. That's the decision for you and I today, too. And faith is really about that. 
Listen, over the next five weeks, we're going to define what biblical faith really is. We're going to define what yielded faith is. And we're going to talk about expectant faith, praying faith, and finally, maturing faith. Now, it's extremely important that we understand that real faith is going to be dynamic, it's going to be radical, it's going to be life-changing. The pandemic of 2020 has shown many of us in ministry that what some people claim to be faith was actually just opinion because fear took over Christendom across the planet. Now, before you say that's too harsh, hear me out. Many Christians shut down. And granted, it was the first pandemic many of us had lived through in ministry, and there were a lot of unknowns. But even after churches began to recover, began to pray through this crisis and seek God's will, and God led us to open back up, we had many who were too afraid, and they still felt challenged to come back and assemble themselves. Now, there are people with medical conditions, okay? And ultimately, and this is the thing about faith. Please hear me. The thing about faith is it's personal. And you either believe or you don't. But listen, hear me out. If it's true faith, biblical faith, it will change your life. And it will help you realize that no matter what else is going on in the world, Jesus Christ is first. My loyalty, my service, my life is his, above and beyond all things. Jesus has made some very, very narrow statements. He said, any man who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is not worthy of me. Unless we are willing to deny ourselves, even to the point of considering mother, father, sister, brother, spouse as hated for his cause, you cannot. These are the words, you cannot be my disciples. Now, sadly, a lot of Christians have settled for something less. Okay, maybe I'm not discipleship material, so I'll just be saved and live on the edge. Be careful about that. There was something different. Remember, Peter, James, and John had not seen Jesus to this point. They did not know him. But they heard him. They saw him. And when this happened with this miracle, they became absolutely convinced. In fact, we're going to see such conviction in Peter. Look at verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees. Here's what he said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. A lot of church people have never gotten this lost. And so I wonder if they ever got truly saved. Because when you see Jesus for who he is, this is going to be a similar response. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah saw the Lord high lifted up. And he said, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man that's unclean. For many people who were part of Christendom to church, as we see it and know it today, have never gotten that lost. Well, I've never done this. I've never done that. God has not had to save me from a terrible life. Listen. Listen. If you sin one time, that's terrible. Yes. In fact, dear friend, any sin is terrible in the sight of God, especially those sins. James 4, 17 says, he who knows to do good. Do you know that reading your Bible is a good thing? Well, yes. Okay. Did you not do it? Sin. Well, did you pray? Well, no, I got too busy. Did you know that not praying is sinful? You see, we have a stack of sins that we no longer look at as being sinful. The Bible says to assemble ourselves together 
And so much the more as we see the day of Christ approaching, well, we know to do that, and we don't do it. When it comes to the Holy Spirit convicting us of certain things that we know we should change, but we don't. That's sinful. That's sin. So life-changing faith starts with Jesus Christ, not our religious beliefs, not our denominational principles. Real faith is not about the Baptist church, the Methodist church, the Pentecostal church, the Presbyterian church, any church. Real faith is about Jesus Christ. When they saw and heard Jesus this day, they came to shore. Now, here's what it says, verse 11. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook, circle the word, all. We learned in another place that Peter, James, and John, their daddies were in the fishing business too. This wasn't just a whim. They went back, forsook their nets, and left daddy holding the nets. This was radical departure from the culture of that day. If a dad was a fisherman, the boys became fishermen. That's the way life was. They are throwing away the family business here. But when they heard him, they saw him, they had a life-changing experience. They forsook all and followed him. Life-changing faith in Jesus demands more than belief. A lot of people believe Jesus is the Son of God. James tells us the devils, the demons in hell believe Jesus is the Son of God. There were demons in the New Testament that when Jesus was ready to call them out, they said, we know who you are. You are the Son of God, and he made them be quiet. They knew more than the people around that day. Belief is not enough. Real faith demands unconditional trust to the point that if there is, oh, and by the way, there is no other way. There is no other one. Everything depends on Jesus. There's nothing for you to figure out. There's nothing for you to plan for. There's no plan B, C, or D. Jesus is everything. And if he's not, if you're banking on something else, listen, all you have is some conviction you've conjured up. It's not true faith. Number three, the reason many do not hear the call of God is they're not listening. Now, these guys could have gone about their own business, and there probably were other fishermen here this day as well. Uh, that's how the business was. These guys chipped, uh, fished all night, came in, and so they were probably numbers of fishermen doing exactly what Peter, James, and John were doing that day. They saw something and heard something in Jesus. As they were doing what they were doing in their run-of-the-mill everyday life, they heard, and it penetrated their hearts. Do you hear the call of God? It's amazing to us who preach and teach. We can have an assembly, large or small, doesn't matter the number, sitting before us, and we're teaching or preaching the Word of God and we can look into faces. Listen to me carefully. I say this with love, but it's truth. We can look into the faces, and we know when they're not listening. They're just sitting there. The lights are on, but nobody's there. Their minds are somewhere else. Real worship means that I must show up with my whole being. The Bible's full of passages that teach us to search for the Lord with our whole heart. The first commandment says to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. God's not in the business of just appealing to parts of us. They're not listening, nor do they believe. 
Life-changing faith is also being fully persuaded that Jesus Christ will do what he says. He'll do what he says. I, uh, last week we were talking a little bit about this, and I've had several conversations since the, uh, the study last Sunday. We have this, we have this notion that God says this, but he means something else. Uh, one of the things we hear a lot among American believers is that things are just so bad. Jesus has got to come today or tomorrow. He's got to come very, very soon. I said last week, I'll say it again. The Chinese Christians have been living under intolerable tyranny for over 100 years. Jesus hasn't come. Many of them died. I have read books by men who had their tongues cut out of their mouths because they couldn't stop telling people about Jesus. The American Christians somehow think we're immune to that. That can't happen here. Listen, things can and they will get a lot worse. I told our men's Bible study class last Sunday morning, we need to understand this, guys. God's word has said that it's going to get worse and worse. That's the scripture. We can go to passage after passage that says it's going to get worse and worse. God is not going to change his word for us. Just because we do not want it to get worse doesn't mean it won't. You and I are going to have to believe God to the point where our faith becomes life-changing. Instead of being wimpy and cowardly and faithless, we're called boldness. In the early church, the disciples went about sharing the faith just after Jesus has gone back into heaven. They were arrested by the authorities. Imagine that happening Sunday morning here at Appalachia. The authorities came in and arrested people both in the congregation and on the ministry team and said, you can no longer speak the words of Jesus in public or you will be fined or imprisoned or worse. How many Christians today in America would say, that's it. I'm going home. We can't risk getting arrested. We can't afford fines. We certainly do not want to go to prison. Now listen, you might say in your heart, well, that would not be me. Peter said the same thing. Peter told Jesus, I will go to prison. You can read about it in Luke. I will go to prison and I will die with you. Jesus said, Peter, Peter, before the sun comes up tomorrow, you will deny you know me three times. And it happened. You may think you know yourself, but when things become desperate and challenging, faith either shows up or it's non-existent. There is nothing in the middle. So we need to understand that life-changing faith is fully persuaded in the person of Jesus Christ to do what he said he's going to do. I'm going to tell you guys, 2024 is shaping up to be a cataclysmic year. January 1st, there was a 7.6 magnitude earthquake in Japan. They're still feeling aftershocks. There are some things that are coming in the world that are being planned, that are getting ready to be deployed in our world that will terrify us to the core of our being unless we become men and women of courageous life changing faith. It's coming. The Bible says it's coming. These folks are not even hiding it anymore. It's coming. We're going to have to get ready. And then life-changing faith begins when one ceases to live as usual and begins to make some radical changes. Radical changes. Well, what do we mean by this? What's this? Many people believe within the scope, within the realm, within the perimeters of what they can do. 
Churches are notorious for this. Well, we will increase our budget 1.2, 1.3, or this, that, or the other, or we're freezing all spending because this is what we can do. That's not what God calls us to, and I'm not being critical. The church either believes or the church doesn't. It doesn't mean stupidity. It doesn't mean recklessness. But it doesn't mean living by faith. A faith that believes God put us here. A faith that believes God will supply the need. Individual families are in the same situation. Life-changing faith goes beyond both our capabilities and our limitations. David and Jonathan were walking down from the mountain down into the valley when they spotted Saul's troops. And uh, they were great friends. Uh, you know the story. Jonathan and David were really, really best friends. And so they're, they're there. And so David says, let's go see what God will do. Let's go see what God will do. He had it was two, of, two of these guys, and they're looking at the entire regiment there of Saul's soldiers. Let's go see what God will do. When's the last time we came to church and we asked that question? Let's see what God will do today. When we come and we only expect what we can do within the limits of our capabilities as well as our shortcomings, when that's the scope of our faith, friends, fellow believers, it's a small faith. It's a weak faith. It's a timid faith. Life-changing faith does not live passively. Again, David and Jonathan, let's go see what God will do. When the disciples had just witnessed Jesus going back into heaven, what they did was, was phenomenal. They went out preaching and teaching, and people were getting saved. They got arrested. When they got arrested and they finally were released, they came back. They did not complain to God about being arrested. Here's what they did. They prayed for more boldness. They asked God to embolden them, make them even more courageous. And again, folks, we're about to witness that kind of life in our culture and in our world. God always calls upon us to move in the direction of God's activities. As the outreach pastor here, when we began this journey, I began to see where God was at work. When the doors would open, I made a commitment to the Lord that I'd walk through that door. And what I learned is in the early stages of outreach ministry was that we have to join God where he's working. Too many times we want God to bless what we're doing. God doesn't bless what we're doing. What he will bless is what he's doing. When we join him in his work, wonderful things will take place. Now, there's one other thing we've got to say quickly before our time has gone today. God grows quiet and distant in our fellowship. Now, we're always going to have him. He's ever present, but he gets quiet. When we fail to live life-changing faith, uh, we married men. We've learned this, uh, I, and please, ladies, this is not this is not a slight to you. This is just facts. It's reality. We know when we've messed up, men, with our wives. How they get quiet. A lot of Christians today said, "I haven't heard from the Lord in a long time. I don't remember the last time He moved me." Mm, maybe you want to ask this question: When did I grieve Him? When did I quench Him? When did I cease obeying him? Because that's why he is quiet. Something to think about. Over the next few weeks, we're going to explore life-changing faith. I hope you'll join with, with me each week. More than that, I hope that you will ask God to increase your faith and give you a bold, dynamic faith that will be truly life-changing for you and those around you. Until this time next week, God bless you.